to Shared Insights, the podcast from BA Insight. My name is Pete Wright, and right over there is Jeff Freed. Hello, Jeff. Hi, I'm right here. It feels like it has been some time since we have podcasted together. You are, once again, I, I assume you are back from your world travels and uh, uh, bless, blessedly at home. Absolutely. And uh, time flies when you're having fun, which it seems like it's all the time now. That's exactly right. We are, uh, as we wrap out the year, we are honored to have uh, a, a very special guest, guest with us today. Uh, Rob Bogue is joining us. Rob is a sought-after speaker, author, and consultant who shares his passion by helping organizations become more effective, more efficient, and more successful. He's written 25 books. He speaks around the world and is here today to share some of the key lessons he's learned on implementing information management, this hot on the heels of the the launch of his latest course for the Association for Information and Image Management, Implementing Information Management on SharePoint and Office 365. Rob, you are checking just about all the boxes uh, with our audience with that course. Uh, welcome to Shared Insights. Well, thank you very much, Pete. Appreciate it. Uh, why don't, uh, Jeff, why don't you kick us off? How You, you uh, have known Rob for some time. Why is this a, a hot topic for us to be uh, talking about today? Well, yeah, Rob and I have bumped into each other, both because we both speak on some of the same conferences and often on some of the same topics, and because Rob has been pulling me towards the organizational aspects of life, about the the people side, at the same time that he's able to keep sort of this dynamic range from developers to end users to business so it just means I don't know what I want to be when I grow up. <laughs> Maybe that's why we're like-minded. I'm still not sure I want to grow up. I was going to say, take a number. <laughs> but Rob, you, you've been working with Search way back, as well as with SharePoint. How many years have you been an MVP? Uh, I have 14 years and 15 awards, which is quite a few. There are, that's fantastic. There are very few of us. Yeah, so sort of one of the originals. It's a very different group. It was a very different thing back then. It was nobody knew what it was, and and you're just this kind of weird guy that that did stuff to help the community, and and nobody really knew when you said MVP what that meant. And I don't think they do today either. But it was a little different. But Jeff, you and I started out in search like forever ago, like eons ago. I think I was telling you that I started out. My first real search was MondoSoft uh, doing an ecom site which has obviously been years and years ago. And I still love it. Search or MondoSoft? <laughs> Search in particular. <laughs> MondoSoft, as you know, has got it got pulled into Surfray and is still going someplace in the, in the depths of uh, Denmark. But what made me feel like this was really topical is that you and I were talking about your information management class. And of, of course, the search parts of that we've talked about for a little while. But information management is one of those things as sort of a bigger umbrella within which search sits, I think is practiced nearly everywhere, but still unusually poorly understood. So what motivated you to come up with a new approach to training people on this? Well, my background, uh, if you get if you get into the way back background, uh, what was going on with me uh, was SharePoint and and Search, and I was I did some work for the product team with this ECM implementers course years and years ago, and it kind of got abandoned. And I was looking at AIM, and they're doing this work about trying to help people understand information management. They're they're trying to help them understand like what are the core tenants and how do you think about it and all that stuff. But there's this gap. Uh, where, you know, really most people have SharePoint as an information management platform, but AIM wasn't doing that kind of last mile connectivity to get people like, okay, so here are the concepts. Well, how do you do it? How do you actually turn the wrench, turn the, flip the switch um, to make the tool work the way that you know it should work? Uh, and so there's this really exciting opportunity to work with AIM on how do we how do we make this real? Because I think information management, you know, everybody practices it, but nobody actually practices, understands the practice of it, um, and so that's kind of that's kind of challenging. Yeah, and I, I am a theorist by background, so these a lot of these frameworks like DICAR, the Inbox, the Body of Knowledge, I eat them up, but I think that they are 
really only used by sort of the cognoscenti, that people who are genuinely moving their organizations forward aren't following those kind of frameworks in theory. They're just trying to get their job done. Yeah, I'd agree with that. I would say that, you know, I think if you were to mention to someone on the street uh, any of the frameworks, they'd be going like, what? What kind of a car? Like a die car? Is that a Hyundai? I, I don't know. <laughs> um, and I, I think that we throw a lot of people into this role of trying to manage information because we've had this explosion of information over the last several decades. Um, and we don't train them. We don't give them any frameworks. We don't, we don't help them think about it in any way whatsoever. So, um, yeah, I, I think my, my perspective is very practical and not at all, Oh, well you have to know this framework or that framework and this is the way you have to do it. It's, it's very much like, how do you just get stuff done? How do you find contracts? How do you how do you make stuff findable? And I think that's the key tie into search, right? Is we can dump a bunch of garbage onto a platform and we make the job for search incredibly difficult. Or we can use psychology and neurology and what we know about people and and, and really work them back to this is the way to do things so that you get the kind of results that you want in the end. I would love to hear more about that because I think when when you know when we approach this as technologists, uh, there's like you said there's a there's a problem that you need to turn a nut so you get a wrench. But as soon as you start talking cross disciplines, right? How do you have to think about those doing the searching in order to deliver them a product that works, makes their lives easier, more efficient? Um, you know what goes into that, and and it sounds like you you almost need to be selling it, uh, you know, to the technologists as much as the users. Yeah, I mean, I think there's some really cool stuff that VA Insight has in terms of analytics and helping you understand on the on the search side what are the users actually doing because that's a that's a key thing is well, great, but but what are the users doing in the end? Uh, but I think there's this planning aspect of it. There's an information architecture aspect of it, and how do we uh, how do we design the system in such a way that we have the tools available to us? So that that we can leverage all these really cool things that are happening in search. If if we don't put in any metadata and we don't trick the users, I, I say we trick users into entering metadata because they don't want to do it. Mm -hmm. um, but if we fail to trick them into doing metadata entry, then you really makes certain things like faceted refiners very hard to do. Okay, darn near impossible to do. Um, so we've got to figure out a way of helping our users take the right behaviors. Uh, by default, we, we want them to do the right thing rather than feeling like they've got to go out of their flow to do something extra. Um, and so there's some really neat things that you can do from information management and information architecture and leveraging the, some of the things that are in the platform, the, the SharePoint platform and, and word property promotion. And there's just lots of little things, little tricks that you can use to make it so that the default answer is the right answer. And that's really cool. That's a lot of fun to do. I, you and I, Rob, sometimes talk on the same topics of information architecture, et cetera, and I try to learn other people's style a little bit. You talk about the Afghanistan effect. Yeah, the Afghanistan effect is, just for those of people that don't haven't heard me talk about it, is so if you have a drop-down, the option that you're going to find in the results of entering metadata, the thing that you're going to find the most frequently is the first entry in the list. Um, and I call it the Afghanistan effect because... Um, we see this when you're doing countries. And so if you take the, the approved countries, the United Nations countries, and you list them alphabetically, the first one in the list is Afghanistan. Ergo, I call this the Afghanistan effect, which is they're going to enter whatever metadata gets them off that page just as soon as possible. Suddenly <laughs> discover <laughs> that all of your customers are, you know, three quarters of your customers live in Afghanistan. Yeah, it's, it's really funny. You're like, oh, I didn't realize that we had such a great presence in Afghanistan. Indiana. Wait, wait a minute. There's no Indiana in Afghanistan. <laughs> well, the other thing that I love about your style, Rob, is that it is very, very pragmatic and it's connected with users. When we first met, you were still launching the SharePoint Shepherd, which I recommend to people still regularly. If you're not, uh, maybe you can describe it. 
Yeah, uh, it's a book that's not a book, so you can get it in book form, but really it was a response to my customers who said, hey, my users don't know how to do X. Uh, and what I realized was there was about 120 of those Xs that they didn't know how to do, whether it was create a column or add an item or just the simple stuff that, that you do in SharePoint every day, but uh, people don't know how to do. And so I created in 2008 the SharePoint Shepherd's Guide for End Users that we licensed to customers. It's got the step-by-step -step instructions for those 120 tasks. It's got uh, videos in its electronic form. It's got step-by-step uh, -step videos. So if you have trouble reading, um, you know, two pages of stuff, you can watch a two-minute video instead. Um, but yeah, we, we love doing that. That's one of the barriers to getting uh, SharePoint deployed is people don't get any training. There's no expense. There's, there's no way to, to really run everybody through it. So you can do this as a self-help tool and it allows people to really uh, get the answers when they need it and not have to sit through that two hour or two day course. Yeah. So it's really all about the end users and making them effective, making it easy for them to do their job and where they're using SharePoint, making SharePoint improve the way they do their job, not get yep. in the way. Yeah, we remove the barrier of I don't know how. Uh, we make that as simple. And, and literally, the funny thing about this is we use SharePoint Search to help people find the right item. So when they're working with it, their SharePoint Search is the way they find um, the thing they need help with, which is super cool. And with all the enhancements that we got with Fast and, and all that integration, uh, we can do some super neat things to promote results from the Shepherd's Guide for people. And sort of the stepwise piece of getting each piece progressively better, get users so they're successful and that that will then improve practices, I, I also love. So, for example, the search relevancy is one of these bottomless topics. You could spend your whole lifetime really understanding relevancy there's a ton of theory around it, but in practice, the things that people need to know about relevancy are around working with managed properties, boosting things through query rules, and it's uh, it can be very effective if you don't overcomplicate it. Well, and I think you know you and I have seen that the, the problem is is that no tool is going to solve every need for every organization. And you need somebody who can sit and watch the system, look at the analytics and, and turn around and, and go, oh, people are searching for widgets and widgets isn't giving them very good results. So why is that? And how do you, how do you fix that? How do you do a quick patch of uh, maybe you promote a result or you promote a block or, you know, but then, then you go deeper and you figure out, well, how do I solve the problem for real, right? Instead of just hacking in, I can hack in a, a quick answer, but how do I go figure out why this thing is not returning results well? Is it we're using synonyms and we're not following the synonyms or what, what is it that's making these things not work? And it's not tool. And that's, that's I think, one of the biggest frustrations that I've had with um, working with search for so long is uh, we, do these, we do these tool migrations instead of saying, we really need to understand the tools we have better. Maybe maybe we need some monitoring. Maybe we need some additional components, but we don't need to just swap engines just to swap engines. Uh, I, you know, I call this the search immaturity cycle that so many people have um, replaced engines because they're not happy with how their search results are working, which has very little to do with the engine, has to do with the practices, uh, sometimes the pieces around it. If you have all of your content in some system that you haven't indexed, then you're not going to find it. But I love the approach and the ability for people to get training in a consumable way is, you know, I love it. If somebody wanted to take your online course, how would they go about it? Uh, there's a page on the AIM site, which which points to it. You can go to my site as well, and if you look under courses, I'll redirect you to the AIM site for uh, getting access to that course. Uh, the course also is available instructor-led. Um, I don't know when we've got that on the schedule, but the the online version of it has a 715-page, wrap your mind around that for a second, 715-page student manual 
uh, as well as 505 minutes of recording. Uh, and some of that's instructions, some of that's lab walkthrough. It's a lot of it's a lot of content to go through. So you know, it's not like go sign up, watch for an hour, and be done. Uh, but at the end of it, you'll absolutely know quite a bit about information management and SharePoint. Everything you certainly everything you should know. And what I and, love about AIM as an organization is they make this stuff you know easy easy to get at, and they have a lot of resources you know right there on their site. So we'll put that in the in the show notes so that people can find it. Yeah, they're AIM's a great organization to work with. They're they're just they've got so many resources and they really are trying to help move forward information management uh and in what we used to call enterprise content management and really just move that forward in the industry so that we're doing better work. All of us are doing better work, not just the academics. The awareness of people of the need for to to learn I'd love your perspective on it. I've, I've recently done two workshops called the Search Managers Boot Camp, and I was su- pleasantly surprised, first of all, at the turnout, and secondly, that people were eager to learn how to do this stuff. Is that on the upswing, or is it just that I haven't been doing this kind of uh, training before? Well, I think, you know, again, you and I have been in this for years and years and years, and so we have had the experience of, Everybody wants good search. Nobody wants to invest in good search. Nobody really understood it, right? It's this black magic thing, and you and, and you put stuff in through the crawler, and it comes out, and you hope it's relevant. Um, I think some of the new attention to search and the idea that you can start to plug in machine, machine language or AI has created both a good and a bad. The good that it has created is additional interest in people saying, you know, I really could get better answers. I could make it easier for my workers to find the information they need. I can build solutions that are going to do real things for them. Uh, so that's, that's that's really cool. And I think the other the other side of that coin, the negative side of the coin, is it's caused a little bit of diffusion to happen. So we're, you know, we used to talk, I think, about enterprise search, dun-dun-dun, and how you had to have, you know, how you had to make resources accessible to people and how do you index the information that's in uh, ERP systems and, and how do you give people a unified view of what the organization knows about someone or something. Um, and I think that this new emphasis on uh, machine learning and AI is pulling us away from that a little bit because I think we're starting to build these specialized search centers and these Microsoft's doing their own thing. And and I think it's pulling us away from that single unified search vision that we've had for so long. I, I think that's more good than bad. The more specialized and focused you can be, the better of a job you can provide. The main challenge is that you don't want to give users 27 different places to go for different things because they won't remember it. It's not convenient. It's not effective. So there are patterns like having a destination center that then gives you vertical experiences. And that's worked very well for for our customers at PA Insight for years. What I think you're alluding to in a maybe politic way is Microsoft's direction seeming in some ways less coherent. It's not just machine learning and AI. It's that throughout the Office 365 suite, there's lots of different flavors of search. And there's four different families now of enterprise search from Microsoft. What's your take on that? Is that overly confusing or do people just take it in stride? From an end user perspective, it's pretty awful, actually. Um, because I have conversations all the time about which search box do I enter that thing in to find my answer, and why can't I just search this library, and why can't I, and and well, what about this Azure search thing? And and I and I, um, it's really, it feels like anytime we add confusion to the market, anytime, it makes it worse for the end users. Um, and, and I get it from a Microsoft move the ball forward kind of innovate kind of thing where you have different people and they do different things. They do them well and maybe not so well. And I get it. But from a how do the users experience it point of view, I think it puts a big burden on IT and 
internal calm to help people understand where to go and what they're going to get. Um, and, in, and in my experience, very few organizations are sufficiently sophisticated to do that job well. Um, so even the classic versus uh, modern interface and, and the way that search changes when you go between those two interfaces is, is a real sticking point and really difficult for users to understand. And I don't think there's an easy answer to it. I think if you're going to innovate, you're going to cause disruption, and disruption isn't good for users. And like I, I don't know that there's an easy answer to it, but it's it's certainly difficult to help users be successful in that environment. You know, certainly we've tried hard at BA Insight to provide something that can bridge across those and give a consistent experience without blocking the innovation that is happening from Microsoft and also from places like Elasticsearch. But I'm hypersensitive to the complexity that users see because there's this axiom in, in UX design, as you know, that the simpler the user experience, the more complicated it is it is to implement it. And when people start expecting that this is just going to work magically with no work on the part of administrators and no one to own it, that's, I think, a setup. I, so I do think that there are folks like BA Insight that are doing good work. I think the level of entropy in the system exceeds what can be done reasonably. I mean, uh, for instance, the degree to which you have the ability to interface in the modern system, particularly on-prem at the moment, since it's non-existent, um, you know, you, you, you've got limitations that hopefully will go away and hopefully we'll be able to continue to unify that experience back again and to make it simpler and to make it more coherent. And, um, but there's certainly a lot of entropy and, and, you know, I would say that the customers who are using BA Insight are, are very uh, privileged uh, to have such great work. Uh, but I, I would say, you know, there's a relatively small percentage of folks who, who have that most folks are are trying to have have not yet decided to make search an area where they will be successful uh, and and by that I mean an intentional decision to make this a place where we excel I just don't think there are many organizations certainly in your customer set that that it's going to be a lot more but in general I just don't think people have made that decision yet yeah I think it's it is you're right it's self selecting that most of the people that I see have some consciousness about putting some investment or effort into search and being successful there. Do you think it's different than other areas of information management? Are there more people that have consciously chosen to be successful at content management versus search? Uh, I think the rest of information management or content management is mandated. It's legalized. It's regulations. Ergo, it, it has a focus, right? Like, if, if you're saying, well, if we don't do this right, we'll be fined, and the fines are six or seven digits, well, all of a sudden it gets attention, right? And, and the reality, I'm not saying this is a good thing, it's not, but the reality is because search, you're not generally fined for, oh, nobody can ever find anything. Um, it, it doesn't get the attention. Yeah, I think it's true. And I think there's a an old book that I love, which is called Great Information Disasters, which it lists among two dozen of these things. Probably half of them are the inability to find the important information you needed to make things work, because that's a big part of information management. It's hard to mandate that. Yeah, I would argue that the whole point of information management is the ability to find it. Yeah. Uh, that way you can consume it, you can reuse it, and retention policies are easy to understand, keep things for this long. Whereas getting people to reuse the content has a lot more organizational elements as well as technology elements. It's part of why I love it. Yeah, I think we, you know, you and I both talk about knowledge management from time to time and how do you, what is knowledge management, but really getting better leverage on the information that is already in the organization. I agree that some of the most powerful solutions that I have personally built in, you know, whatever it's been, I'm not going to tell people how many years it's been, but the most powerful solutions. <laughs> this, say, is, this is a safe space, Rob. <laughs> exactly. But and, and I will say you still have hair. <laughs> I, 
I still have hair, but it's gray. <laughs> anyway, it, the, the most powerful, the most amazing things have always been about making that information usable. And that to me, you know, I go into organizations where it, it, they're writing stuff on paper slips and they're getting lost and we fix that. And it's amazing. And I go to organizations where they've got 5,000 clicks to get something done and we convert it to five. And that's amazing. And all of that stuff, which is the ability to use this precious resource we have called information and to keep from getting overwhelmed by it. That's so amazing. Yeah. And, and, and that's uh, what's really cool. Now, I, I'm optimistic that, in fact, the awareness of the ability to be successful there's sort of a chicken and egg situation that a lot of people haven't experienced success, so therefore they haven't, they can't really visualize it. They can't decide that they're going to be successful at findability. Um, I think that's getting better slowly, but but I'm I, I'm optimistic. I I think that the reputation that search had historically, which is well, you go to search when there's nothing else you can do to try and find the information. I think that's that's fading. I don't think it's gone yet, but I think the number of people that hold that opinion is is small. Um, I, I, I think that my observation has been more people start by searching than start by navigating. And I couldn't have said that five years ago. I couldn't have said that with a straight face five years ago. But I think now with the improvements in the platforms and the understanding and the tuning and everything else, I, I, I really do see more people start with search and then they'll fall back to navigation if they have to. Um, and that's a big shift. Absolutely. So you do a lot of focus on organizational development as well as on the technology part. What led you to that and how would you advise people sort of bring these together? Right. You, you're talking on one hand about SharePoint. You do development work, I mean, I, by which I mean coding. Yeah. And on the other side, you also help people with organizational behavior, development, uh, habits, adoption, things of that sort. I, I think that's an amazing dynamic range. So how do you bring them together? What you have to understand is like I, I said at the start, which is we're, you know, I don't know what I want to be when I grow up. I've done the development. I wrote some of the guidance, early guidance on how to develop on SharePoint, done infrastructure, big and, you know, super redundant, blah, 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 blah. Um, and I got to this point where I did the shepherd's guide because I do these beautiful implementations and nobody would use them, right? And SharePoint as a tool is really communication and collaboration. We could, we could get into all the pie wedges and all that stuff, but, but it's communication and collaboration, and so I did the shepherd's guide thinking the problem, why, why organizations aren't changing is because they just don't know how to use the tool, right? And so I taught them how to use a hammer. And I thought that somehow by teaching them how to use a hammer, I was solving the problem that they had. Here's the problem. That's not the problem. The problem is organizations are organizations and they're resistant of change. And we've never trained, uh, we, we, we never train technologists and we rarely train anybody else on the planet on how to do organizational change. And so I came to organizational change through how do I take this great work that I'm doing with SharePoint and Search and, and all of that, and how do I get organizations to actually use it and get value out of it? Um, and so, you know, in 2008, I built the Shepherd's Guide. By about 2009, 2010, I got, okay, great. People are more effective with the Shepherd's Guide. Certainly, that's we get lots of praise from customers. But, but there's more, right? Like they're not communicating well. They're not talking to folks in a way that engages them inside the organization. They're not, uh, they've not figured out that trust is important for collaboration and you have to have safety and you on and on and on. Um, and that's what got me to doing organizational development. And, and if you, if somebody were to go out and look at my blog, they'd be like, this guy doesn't do technology because they'd find 300 book reviews and of which maybe 20 are technology. The rest of them are all psychology, neurology, and how do you change uh, groups of people into doing better behaviors? Well, the, the hardest part of any IT project is always the change management part anyway. The funniest thing I've come across, and, and so, you know, a couple hundred books, the funniest thing uh, that I have come across is, and, and maybe it's only funny to me, but it's, you know, imagine trying to do physics if atoms had feelings. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, 
<laughs> you know, and you read that and I start cracking up and my wife is like, what are you doing? And but it's but that's that's our technology projects, right? Like we're we're doing physics, but the atoms all have feelings and they get their feelings hurt and then they don't do what they're supposed to do. And and so, yeah, I I, I think the hardest part absolutely is. How do you help people be comfortable with change? That's that is absolutely brilliant. I'm stealing it uh, from you or whoever gratefully. Uh, that that's a wonderful parallel, and and it, in in fact, it seems to uh, you know to call attention to that space of awkwardness, that space that you know users have to go through, that sort of valley of despair. They have to get frustrated enough, not too frustrated, but just frustrated enough to be willing to learn. Yeah. We, t- we sometimes also talk about um, everybody's favorite radio station. It's WIIIFM. What is in it for me? <laughs> and, and we forget organizationally to talk to people from how does it impact them. And, and that's a real weakness. That's a, that's a barrier that creates people digging in their heels because they're afraid they're going to lose their job or they're going to lose respect or they're going to not be in control or, or, or. Um, and and yeah, it's it's a real barrier to people being able to move forward. That's really cool, and brings us sort of full circle. The connection of that to then exciting new elements in technology that allow you to be more effective. There's sort of a virtuous cycle there. If you um, wanted to give advice to our listeners about you know what can they do pragmatically, a couple of steps to just improve the situation around them in this arena what what would you say uh the first thing is learn how to trick your users whether that's setting the right defaults whether that's leveraging things their behaviors and capturing them and we get a little bit of that with machine learning and and some of those things Um, but i would say how do you get your users to take the behavior you want them to take or the or the best behavior as the default that's just what what's normal it's it's called uh inflow don't add one more thing to their task list. That would be out of flow. But how do you get more things to happen in flow by default? Within that, search is just an enabler to make that flow work better as opposed to an additional thing you do. Right. Or or what we're doing is we're giving search the raw material to work from, right? Like if, if I make the default such that the metadata gets assigned correctly um, and I'm not having to use an auto class tool and, and auto class tools are great and they have their purpose and on and on. But, but how do I make the system actually give you an authoritative answer for the classification of something, but do it in a way that doesn't require any extra effort from the user, that kind of stuff ultimately gives you power because it allows search to be effective. It's kind of like, you know, if you put a V12 in a Pinto body or a Yugo body, or I should come up with a car that's current so that, you know, the younger listeners can actually know what I'm talking about. But <laughs> but if you put a really big engine in a really bad frame and body, what, you know, what good does it do you? Um, and that's, I, I think that search engines have gotten a lot better. Certainly things like what, what BA Insight adds to it, it's better. But if you don't have the raw materials, if you don't have the right way to get that power down to the road and start moving, you know, you, you it's very, very difficult. Um, so that right behavior, that default behavior being the right answer is is super important. Perfect. Well, I'll take away from this that I should have the right body for my engine. I'll get into working on my body now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I did not intend to, to say that you should exercise more. That's, what we, that's <laughs> what we call emergent lessons, right? This is emergent behavior. I did not see that coming, but Jeff, I'm glad you took us there. <laughs> All right. Yes, absolutely. We will have links to, to the, the class in the show notes uh, and uh, also to uh, SharePoint Shepherd and Thor Projects. Any place else you'd like us to point uh, our listeners who want to learn more about you, Rob? No, I think they'll be tired of learning from me. If they if they go to SharePoint Shepherd and they go to Thor Projects and they look at the AIM course, they'll be very tired of learning <laughs> random things about me. So this is, this is uh, that will be the end of it. We will protect the listeners. They don't want to be overdosed on the great Rob Bogue. Is that what, that's what we're saying, I think. Uh, this has been a fantastic conversation. Thank you, sir, for joining us today uh, to uh, uh, share your thoughts on information management uh, here with Jeff. Sure, appreciate it. Pete, thank you. And Jeff, as always, I appreciate uh, the chance to sit and chat about all things search. 
Uh, it's always fun. Thank you. Always fun. Thank you so much, Jeff and Rob. I'm Pete Wright. On behalf of these two fine gentlemen, uh, we will catch you next time right here on Shared Insights, the podcast from BA Insight. Thank you.